All right. So huge project progress has been made. I finally got it on Facebook Live. All right, folks, uh, I'm waiting for Paul to get on here. Should be here any minute. Um, we're going to get going today here shortly. Um, just filling a little bit of time before 8 o'clock. So if you happen to be watching, thanks for stopping by and tell all your friends. This is something we're going to do on Tuesdays from now on until early September. We're going to start at 8 p.m. Central, which is 9 o'clock Eastern. And we're uh, going to discuss a whole bunch of stuff, primarily good times. And uh, Paul should be along, like here he comes, I believe. Tonight, we're going to talk a little bit with Chris Lagone um, at 8.15 about the U.S. or the, excuse me, the uh, PDGA Masters Championship that was last week. And then our guest tonight is Sarah Holcomb. And hey, look, they're coming around. You guys need to turn that screen. <laughs> There's a rotate button somewhere in there. Shit, yeah, okay. There we go. Every platform is different. <laughs> All right, and there's Paul. All right, yes. so we're underway. Hold on. Gosh dang it. This thing is so stubborn. It's like you're riding on a roller coaster. Just pretend you're on a roller coaster. I'm feeling a little zoomy right now. Man, I yeah. tell you, my stomach's dropping. Sorry. Or it's rising, one of the two. We can scoot over. Why don't we just put it where it is, and then we can scoot well, it's the, over. It's the, well, it's the rotation of it. There you go. There, it's not, it's, it's straight. Yeah, it's not. There we go. There we go. Is that nice. better? Nice. That's totally awesome. What up? How's it going? <laughs> Cheers, gang. Things are good. No complaints. All right. I'm the one. I'm the only one with water. There's water in this. Yeah, it's like it's like 80, 87 percent water. Eighty seven percent. Is that from your science background? She knows what she's it's talking 13, about. Yeah, it's 13 yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, I did the math, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's too hot around here to drink. I'm, gonna, I'm back at the shop at seven. So oh, I'm not drinking until here. maybe. Yeah, we're out all the way up in Michigan and it's, it's freaking hot. hot. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. But I think we set we definitely set a record for the year today. Oh, um, and, uh, you know, it might have been for I thought I saw something where it said recorded history, but it's only 104 now. So that can't be right. But definitely okay. for the year. Hottest day of the year. Ooh. Yesterday, uh, it, it broke the record of yesterday. Y'all are just cooking down there. Yeah, and it's hot in Dallas. Yeah, the wind's not blowing very hard either. So mm -hmm. there you have it. For once. For once. Yeah, it definitely came in hotter this in the early part of the summer to the wind did anyways. Now it's kind of settled down. Yeah, Speaking everywhere of... we played this year, everyone says, wow, it's just been so windy this year. We keep hearing this uh, this like common theme. theme of wind. No matter where we're at. It's been where we go is the windiest of, it's, it's ever been there in wow. the like, That's pretty yeah. ironic there. It's good for birth. some years. It's like it just rains every finals. This year, it's windy every tournament. Yeah. <laughs> there but was a year had... when I was on tour, fourteen out of sixteen weekends, it rained sometime between like five p.m. Thursday night and five p.m. Sunday night. <laughs> like so, just when the van dries out and it doesn't smell like. Well, you know, whatever. Like yeah. wet cardboard and <laughs> wet clothing yeah. and wet people and wet vehicle. Oh, wait, here it's raining again. Yeah, it was tough. I'm really, I'm, I'm pretty good at playing in the rain, but I mean, I'm not really good, but I, I can play in the rain. Hope I don't ever have to do it again. Yeah. Well, I mean, we were promised that there wouldn't be rain or- Yeah, we- Really? Yeah. 
Who we'll told you that? that. We'll get to that. We got some money that we're all this year. Yeah. And uh, Masters World. Some crazy, yeah, whatever. Oh, uh, a lot of it too. Yeah, the last day and a half. Yeah. Um, and uh, those courses are not well equipped for that at all. It was a mud fest. And the tee pads are really yeah. sketchy. Well, in the rain they are. Yeah. Ray Ben. Okay, so that brings. Oh, here comes. You know who that here, is. Come, come here, here Bubba. come You want to say hi to the pup? You miss her? Yeah, of course uh, I miss her. Say hi to Bubba. Raven's awesome. Hey, Raven. Hey, Raven. Oh. Would you behave, please? Is that a piece of... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Here we go. She's behaving, as you can see. Same old Raven. Yep. Same old. Yeah. I'll see her soon enough. Well, it won't be soon enough, but it'll be soon. I'm it'll planning. I'm hoping if I can, I'm probably going to come to him for you, but I'm not 100% sure. For Worlds? Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Sweet. Not 100%, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to line that out for sure. Yeah. That'd be good to see you. Yeah, that's always a good one to hit. Pro Worlds can't really beat it. Best yeah. of the best. Going up against the toughest courses in the world. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, we just played Northwood Black. I would say that those are not. Oh, okay, yeah. Northwood Black is pretty nasty. No. I played Northwood Black. Anyways. Yeah. yeah, so how you guys been doing? It was like, uh, we haven't talked for like a month. I know, it's been too long. Way too yeah, long. Yeah, it was schedule conflicts. Yeah, the last time we tried to do this and um, man, uh, you know, I've been pretty busy. Like super busy. Mm-hmm. So, uh, busy. busy is good. Yeah. Since we're catching up, do you guys have the information? Uh, we're dying to know. Maybe some of our viewers are actually interested to know. What happened to our picks at the Colorado Championships at the? Uh, oh Netflix yeah, yeah. Those are in the van. Um, oh. I'm pretty sure we all failed. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, no. I don't think anybody had own. Picks Nobody picked to win. own. Yeah, and then I don't think anybody picked Joel. Nobody picked Joel for yeah. sure. Yeah, that's true. I you sounded really confident. That's why I picked you. I was like, oh, Sarah's going in there. She's got a big it head of so steam. Close. On it was so close. But Owen, like Owen made two putts from circle two and one from outside of circle two in the first five holes. And you just knew that she was in a zone. You knew that there was nothing you could do. Yeah. You made a, a, a lot of really good shots and, and made some big putts, and she just would just never stop making putts. And like she missed one inside the circle and made a joke. She was like, oh, I guess I need to be further away because she was making everything in circle two or beyond. And it was just. Yeah. And as she does, as she's shown to do, mm -hmm. as she did. And, you know, she didn't win women's nationals, but she was really high up in the ranks. She was right there. And yeah. then she almost won Idlewild and she won U.S. women's masters by, almost by a lot. She destroyed she's, having, she's on fire. I mean, there's no question yeah. about it. And yeah. she's, and, you know, and she's. It's not just age protected stuff that she's on fire at too. No. Oh yeah. She's, she's right there in the hunt. Right now. Yeah. So yeah. where'd she come from? I don't know that much about her. She's from originally she's from Laos. Um, and then she met her husband uh, while he was traveling over there doing work. And then they um, got married and they're over here. They've been over in California for mm -hmm. the last, I don't know how long, for mm -hmm. a while. Um, and then she tried to tour a little bit early, like 20, 2012, 2013, 2014. She made a really good run at the world title in 2014. She was in the final four and kind of made a name for herself. But then she took a step back from the sport because there wasn't enough money in it for the women to actually, you know, like tour full time. So she took a step back and she pursued a job in like massage therapy and was trying to get a degree and do her thing. And she eventually accomplished all of that. Um, and then the sport blew up and now she can afford a tour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so now she's on the tour good. for the first time ever. And we're seeing what, you know, what someone who has the financial support um, and the talent can do. We're yeah. seeing the fruits of that. She's the, she's the best putter in the game. I'm not talking about on the women's side, like in the game. Maybe it would be interesting. To, Her circle two percentages are yeah. ridiculous. Well, if you look at the, I mean, I think a little bit of, a little bit of information could be pulled from the all-star weekend. Yeah. You know, um, she, there was a putting challenge. There was um, like skills mm -hmm. challenges mm -hmm. on that one mm -hmm. day. Um, I don't know how her score compared to the other men's scores, but um, she's just, you know, she destroyed the women's side. She, yeah, uh, she, she is a uh, assassin with a putter. 
and she's starting to figure out her sidearm. Like we saw a lot of really technical. Yeah, she's gotten shots. a lot more distance on her sidearm, a lot more accuracy on all of her shots. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so she's got backhand sidearm, and then she can putt like a like a genius. And so. she's got a great attitude all the time. She's yeah, she's in a really good headspace. Yeah. You know, she's like, I have my family. I have you know. I'm not struggling in any really any ways. So like it's just easy to go out and play golf. Yeah. So she's like in a really good headspace. Yeah, it's fun to That's watch. Nice. I mean, you know, Sarah, you're a professional athlete and you've got a very long athletic background to be in that mental space, to have that comfort, to let all the, because there's a lot of distractions. Regard, I mean, everything's a distraction out there. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that, that mental, you know, that fortress of, of solitude, like Superman had. Yeah, I think it's really about, you know, for her, you know, she's now she's, you know, in her 40s now, you know, I think she's just really comfortable in her own skin. And she knows what she is. And she doesn't care what other people think. Yeah. And she, you know, does her thing, you know, and I think that, you know, I think as we come into more of the social media and all of, you know, the modern world, um, I think that that becomes even harder and harder. Yep. you know, for people to get into that space. Mm -hmm. um, and she's found a way to get there. So, you know, I'm taking notes. Well, yeah, no, I, <laughs> there was a moment that I can remember she she's uh, ahead of the field by a large amount, right? She's just kind of like working her way through the holes and just continuing to, to score and do these things. And she uh, is inside the circle and she's on a, a kneeling putt and she follows through with the putt and puts her hand down on the ground. So that's a falling putt. Uh, it's addressed by the card and they come to the realization that, you know, it is a falling putt. The putt does count, but now there's a penalty stroke assessed to it. And she just kind of just kept moving on. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. she, she didn't, uh, a lot of players that could kind of derail you, you mm -hmm. know, and she didn't really seem to show, she, she was, show, she showed a slight bit of disappointment, but she, but she also kind of looked back at the card whenever it happened as if she kind of knew, that she had done what she had done. And, and it was just on the card to, to make the call at that point. So she took it in stride. She took her four and she moved on and she continued to do her thing. So, and she um, did, it wasn't for a birdie anyway on the whole. So she just got a par. Yeah. She said, yeah. she said her par. So, and, but again, like, uh, there was no like animosity. I didn't feel like she felt any kind of way mm -hmm. towards the rest of the women on the card. And it was just, uh, you know, she kind of like, Owen is always like smiling and she's like, you know me. Yeah. And that's a situation where someone can, yeah, someone can really yeah. um, lose it. But well, that's yeah. a that's a tough spot too because you know I mean it's natural to react to that to that and just go oh my you know and just want to have a fit about it and you know really honestly if you were if you're in the right spot if you're in the right headspace you just go well okay mm -hmm. so if I had one to spare <laughs> yeah no I get a spare you know help me get an extra birdie yeah, there. yeah. Um, so. That's so what I, I constantly remind myself, oh, well, you know, I'm not here for exercise. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Mason and I, I were trying to watch these these women kind of do their thing. You know, like the I think the FPO or FP40 division, I could almost call it FPO, <laughs> was great. really, really deep this year. You had a number of touring pro women that were competing uh, in this division this yeah. year. I mean, we had, I mean, was the own one. And then Jen, Jennifer Allen yep. got second. Yep. Stephanie Vincent from Texas got third. Yep, I yep. got fourth. Um, no, I didn't get fourth. Holly got fourth. Oh, Holly got. She's on the tour. Um, right, Wisconsin. You. Yep. I got fifth. Yep. Um, and then Juliana Corver got sixth. Elaine King's right there. And so then Elaine King got second. So there's ten seventh. world championships between those two, and eleventh here. And then you look at Owen, who's She's got, got two, two more. Jen's got a map. She doesn't have. A uh, she got U.S. Masters last year. Yeah. yeah. And then and Holly's then, still trying to get hers. But let's not forget the fact that these, her and Jen won a doubles world championship. Oh, we hadn't forgotten. We were going to bring that up later. Okay. Yeah. No, it was, <laughs> I got to, I got to see the second round of it. Um, the alternating alternate. Yeah. They alternate shot, shot. They shot five down bogey free. Wow. That's amazing. It was, it was, <laughs> it was pretty perfect it was crazy. and anytime we made a mistake the other person it stepped up and crazy. made a great shot so it was it was i mean we saved pars a bunch of times and then got burned we started off times. like two down through three yeah and it was pretty just, cool like jennifer and i have just exactly opposite skills yeah that's perfect you know but then you never know yeah, how that's true i can see times. that yeah so we had a great vibe going and it was super fun and yeah yeah it's fun to watch 
Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that was really cool. I uh, I didn't even realize that was already going on. And then I saw a video of it. I was like, oh, oh, well, I missed that. <laughs> yeah. I was checking in pretty much every day, though, and, and uh, you know, checking scores because, you know, like, I really – I'm I'm definitely gonna go to that next year. I really like yeah. found myself kind of kicking myself, but I just really didn't have it the time to to work it out proper in order. Yeah, to and dude, there. you see so many of all the old schoolers there. Like it's oh, just yeah. like, and like the just, of disc golf history. It's disc golf history for sure. Yeah, and like everywhere you look, and like even like I don't even know, but like there was an issue with uh, the way that uh, field events and the doubles championships were being addressed. Uh, by the the tournament directors, which were we recently found out that were kind of they were kind of acting on their own as a, aside from the event itself. But they tried to they tried to act like the uh, like the the field events, like the putting world championship and the the skill shot world championship and the du- the doubles and the distance weren't actually world titles. And so um, a number of our legends in the sport that hold a lot of those world titles, whether it's putting and you know who we're talking about and like some of the other things um, that were told that they were no longer five time putting world champions or they're like, it's just a C tier. Yeah. It's not a major. It's not a, it's they're not, just side events side at events. the world championship. So they basically tried to strip a number of these uh, legends of the sports from their uh, previous multiple world titles. Uh, and so there was like this big kind of like uproar of these people coming together and saying like, we're not going to um, allow these people to kind of, belittle the things that we've done for so many years um because a couple of people decided at one tournament that we're going to call it something different than what it's always been and so it was kind of yeah there's a little bit of a transition phase going on i think yeah well so okay so that brings me to something that i definitely okay so i first and foremost i don't want to get into a situation where we're throwing anybody under the bus or beating anybody whatever verbally or publicly or anything like that however i've been saying this i mean it's this is like my 15 year anniversary of being since I was off tour, mm-hmm. which is kind of strange and everything like that. Mm-hmm. But I've probably been saying this for at least 20 years. And that is that if you're going to put your name on this event and you're going to say this is a world championship, then and, but we're still going to leave it in the hands of local people. And we're going to and we're going to include a bunch of local flavor. I'm fine with both of those things. However, there needs to be clear definition to that. And there needs to be some things where the PDJ says, okay, this stuff, here's a list. And here's, and, and these things on this list, it's okay for y'all to do pretty much whatever you want, but we still want to have, you know, approval of it. We want to, we want to mm-hmm. look it over before everything is finalized. Mm-hmm. And then this list over here, you have absolutely no say in it whatsoever, because this is something that we've done for year after year after year. And yeah. that in itself right there is the problem with the world championship is because it goes from one set of hands to another set of hands to another set of hands. And mm-hmm. I'm not diminishing anybody's effort and I'm not trying to light anything on fire or throw anybody under the bus. Right. But we all know, we've all seen quality worlds and we've all seen worlds that were a C tier. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's and and so that being said, that I mean, I don't understand how that's 20 years later. I mean, I'm, this isn't a new idea. I mean, I was no. beating this drum when I was in the middle of my touring days, which were 15 or 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. And, well, yeah, what I know, though, is that, you know, they they do, they do a site visit, you know, like a year in advance. And then they do another site vi- visit like months in advance. And then the PDGA does send out a pretty substantial number of representatives yeah. um, in order to ensure that the tournament happens the way it does but they still rely uh, har- largely on the local organizing yeah. committee um and you know that's they're going to run it like they run a tournament and then the pdga's job is to come in there and make sure that it's run as a high level tournament yeah. you know and i, I think i think they're still working a lot of that out and um you know i'm sure that if you talk to you know rebecca duffy or um, robert leonard or one of those folks out there they can show you those checklists you know, I, I don't think that they don't exist. I think that it's possible they're maybe not as comprehensive as you want them to be. Um, and also, you know, the communication between the local organizing committee and the PDGA is sometimes a little bit um, strained. You know, the PDGA said, hey, you need to do this. Local organizing committee is like, eh, I'm going to prioritize these the way I want to prioritize them and maybe not do all the things. Right on. And I understand that. But 
So I've heard, I've heard there is a list. list. There's got to be a yeah. list of things that absolutely have to happen. I think that that's, I think that does exist. And um, when it comes to like, just like the way that we think about all of that, like the, these people are doing the best that they can, mm -hmm. but also like with the way the pro tour is running their events as a, as a, like a private entity. I mean, they're just doming what volunteers can do mm -hmm. and then the PDJ can do remotely. You know, like the yeah. level is just so different. It's very different. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And so even though this was a major and it's a bigger tier than elite series, the fact that the pro tour wasn't involved in any of it, um, you know, it showed. It was obvious. Yeah. I, I feel like uh, the local clubs were, were stretched out because you 14 have courses, 14 courses, you have 1500 competitors between the masters and the, and the juniors. Right. So maybe it was a little bit more of an undertaking than they were probably prepared for, because I know there was a little bit of disconnect between the PDGA and the local clubs, but uh, like Sarah had an issue with uh, some tee pads on a course and she tried to make that uh, she vocalized that to the people that were running the events. Yeah. But I text them. Right. I just, I just call them. I'm like, Hey, this is a problem. She busted her knee, like bleeding. Yeah. She's bleeding because the tee pad is old and the aggregate is coming to the surface. And now we have a slippery tee pad. It hasn't even rained. It's just been. It's just it's, been dew. It's just, it's just been dew. Yeah. It's just dew that's causing the moisture. Yeah. And so she slips. She checks the tee pad. Slips. Both feet fall out from underneath her. Busts her knee. She's bleeding, um, and makes it known. And then there's not not the best response to that, but there's also uh, no remedy to the situation that's been discussed at all and i totally understand because you have 14 courses right so how do you fix 14 courses worth of tea pads because it rains right but um there just wasn't enough people and the difference is when i would send that text to the pro tour with, which only has 18 tea pads they would be like we'll fix it they we'll, we'll it. get on it yeah, you know whereas it. with the pga 14 courses you know 18 tea pads per course or more even because they're shorts and longs yeah, um they were like no look we'll discuss it but i can't make any promises yeah and that's what you we know? said and, you know and, and then they were like we'll hope it doesn't rain the, no they said <laughs> they said don't worry it won't rain and then it rained for the, for the, uh, for the that's where that came for the fourth round yeah. for the so, fourth round it rained. so my strategy to deal with that was just to bring a beach towel and a I, full length a full, full length yeah. full length so i can get both my feet on it and yeah. so I practiced several days prior to the event, just throwing off the beach towel. So I was used to running up onto it. And that's what I did. I did it like on probably like seven or eight holes. No problems. Yeah. It, looked, it worked out. Yeah. But it's just a, it's just a, something different than what you're normally used to doing in your normal like routine of throwing a Well, shot. in 13, 14 years, I've never, well, one, no, one time I put a beach towel down at the Pro Tour Championships yeah. on hole 18. One time in 13 years on the road but your foot your foot action is fairly compact compared to a lot of people too so i mean that, that, probably, that probably wasn't as horrible of a adaptation as like say someone like james conrad who needs a runway and yeah oh, and, you know so like three blocks have, into the neighborhood yeah i have a three-step approach right so well, we like will. it the first step is off the off the or even close to being on the um the beach towel and then the last two are just on it so i don't have like three or four to run mm -hmm. up and try to yeah. to hit the beach towel well no and like speaking of what you're saying we watched uh ed bailey conrad uh had a slip and fall yeah on a at the mass play championships he, he fell the and then he couldn't he couldn't like trust his run up on it that yeah. all the next holes because the turf was that happened good. that happened to me like at the beginning of my career and i doubted everything after that it's so scary <laughs> i'm gonna it's stumble over that i'm probably gonna fall down because of that you know yeah. <laughs> i'll tell you though after i busted my knee open that yeah. one day i was tentative on everything yep. after that because yeah i was like if i fell again on that knee mm -hmm. it's gonna be super painful so yeah there were some there were some player safety issues on a couple of the courses northwood black had a couple of places where um like areas would normally probably be out of bounds but they weren't so you had to find casual relief into places that were unplayable like into the middle of the thicket and stuff like that so um black's pretty nasty black's nasty i think it's you know it has the potential to be a, a really really good course it really does but it just needs some some cleanup in some areas and maybe a little bit more like refinement in places i made a post and a lot of people took it as me being disrespectful but that wasn't the course at all like it's just I feel like the course has, like, it's fair. It's fair in a lot of places, but there's some places where it's completely unfair. It's know? a savage course. It makes you cry. Yeah. 
Well, and so, you know, there's, I think there's a lot more of that needed at times. Now, I don't mean it like that, but like, like, say, for example, when I played, I played behind Zane, or I stood behind Zane when I took him out to Rock Hill for the first time last year. Mm-hmm. And he stood on hole 12. And you may or may not have heard about the shot that James Conrad threw in on 12 during Chance and mm-hmm. Chumps. But it was in the, it was to the left of the tree on the right there at the, at the edge of the OB. And, you know, I mean, it's a, it was a crush. I mean, it was, you know, maybe a 350 or something like that. But, but Zane, Zane threw two of them to the similar spot, like back to back on a rope. And I'm just like looking at it going, okay, how do we, and I've probably already said this before, but how do we design for that now? Yeah. You know, and, and so that being said, maybe this is a, maybe this is a step in that direction. I don't know, but I know y'all are tired of ball golf courses. <clears throat> well, no, like this, this court, like, uh, like the first, I love Northwood Black from the shorts. From the shorts. Don't get me from wrong. From the shorts. That's a very, very <laughs> but we didn't get to play that in Masters. Uh, but like the, the front nine is probably uh, some of the most fun golf I've played, even though it kicked my ass all over, or excuse me, it kicked my butt all over the place. It's very fair. It's very Where's fun. Nice? Yeah, yeah. But like, uh, it's, it's good golf. Then you get to like 12 through 18. Holes 12 and 14 <clears throat> averaged uh, at Leadstone. Hole 12 averaged, at, it's a par five. It averaged at a 6.7 or 6.67. So it's averaging 1.67 over par. So it's averaging at like a, a par six and a almost six and a half. Almost a seven. It's probably like a par six, a hard yeah. par six. Hard six. And like uh, it averaged at a 9.3, 0.93 over whenever we played it. Hole 14 is very much the same way. It's like, it's these holes that are uh, like you're playing two to three different holes within one hole, and they're they're fun and fair, but they just you know like you, you really need to throw a mid four hundred feet, yeah, right, you, yeah, to get to the to get to the pinch points. But most people are going to try to throw a fairway driver four hundred feet, yeah, to try to get there. I sure because most people don't throw a mid four hundred no. feet, but the des- shots are like designed for a mid, but you have to throw a, you know, you have to throw a faster disc because the landing zone is so far away. And also, so very specific. Like I landed, I got across the creek in two on 12, um, but I had to throw like a 40 foot out because I was so pinched that like my next shot, you have to throw up the face of this hill. And then you have like a 300 foot tunnel shot that reminds you of like BRP once you get to the top. So you have to place your shot from the bottom of the hill to the top in such a place that you're centered up and able to throw another shot. And so uh, I think the best I scored on that was like an eight on this par five that averages like a I'm really six happy with seven. a six from the shorts. Yeah, it's crazy. It's and crazy. the shorts um, play basically one stroke easier from the, for the women because the men, if they get to the short pad, that's like a really good yeah. tee shot. Okay. Right. So it basically plays one stroke easier for the women. Yeah. So me take saying like, I'm happy with a six is basically mm-hmm. saying I'm happy with a seven. Yeah. Or a seven and a half. Seven and a half. Well, you had out of 120 MP40 uh, competitors, you had two people that finished under par, you know, for the whole weekend. So it was definitely a challenge. Yeah, they played the MPO courses as MP40s, and the MPO courses are hard for the MPOs because they've been really pushing the limit on that. And then like, hey, why don't we just show the MP40s on that course? The The one that's really hard for the MPOs. (laughs) Let's put the MP40s on it. Eleven over was nine ninety. Think about that. Double digits plus one is nine. nine is almost a thousand rated golf on that course. So you can bogey every hole but six and still shoot thousand rated. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. Sounds like you've been doing the math already. Uh, oh, yeah. hmm. no, no. Anyway. Anyway, that's like Masters World. And also Joe Revere won that one. Congrats. Um, you know, Dave had had Dave Felberg won it like three years in a row. Yeah. And now Joe Revere came through. And also, we had a nice battle with him and Joe Hansen oh, right down to the end. It was close. Yeah, I thought Joe Hansen <laughs> made a really good Joe Hansen might strike and get that one. Because, man, he's, yeah. he all of a sudden, well, you know, again, I wasn't following, but I was checking every day. And I was like, yeah. oh, wait, slung it right up there. And then and then he got in a little trouble. And but then it Martin like there was plenty Hendel, of trouble to go around every, for everybody. Yeah, yeah, and Martin Hendel from Canada had the lead for a little while. And he was like, he was right up in the mix as well. So Alan Wagner. Alan oh, Wagner. Get, that, get that maple leaf out, B. Yeah. Go ahead. Alan get Wagner. that maple leaf out. Yeah, we'll even support him, even if he's from St. Thomas. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, him and Sandy are so I love nice. you, Martin. Come on. 
Yeah. But congrats to Joe Revere. He's yeah. been grinding out there for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And he's like a full-time educator. Mm -hmm. um, and he's always kept his job. Um, and he also comes from Elevation. So he's playing out in Colorado most of the time. So you don't get to see a lot of him out on the road just because he's doing his thing, um, his teaching months. gig. Yeah. But it, this is the summer months. And it's like big respect for coming from Elevation mm -hmm. and getting a handle on your bag quick enough to w win a world title against some of the best. That's definitely yeah. something that a lot of people don't know about. Yeah, yeah, so that's really cool. The difference between, you know, 6,000 feet and 139 feet. The other super highlight I got to point out is Johnny McRae. Let's talk about that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, we definitely want to have him on the show, too, at, at some point in the not too distant. I think we can probably make that. I'm happen. sure he would love that. Yeah. He's, he's a very personal dude and probably <laughs> would love to join you. One of my, my all-time best favorite interviews that I ever did during the radio show was was with him. And he told me about a story about he was he was definitely only going to know it. And his wife kept saying, that, hey, listen, you don't need to do this. You need to go to the doctor right now. And, he, and like <laughs> she just put her foot down. And like he came in and told me this when we were doing it was like dots in the radio show at the USDGC long mm -hmm. before we ever had video. And and it, it just it blew me away. I mean, it, it he, you know, he and he survived it again now and then goes and stomps a mud hole in it, you know. And I wouldn't even say stomp the mud hole in it because I mean Barry was in the hunt and there was a oh, battle. Yeah. yeah. Barry's not a battle there. Not, and I was just like I mean, Well, JB, I mean, you got uh not yeah. JB. I'm talking about uh Pat. TV. Patrick Brown. Patrick Brown. Yep. Yeah, he was right there. You know, that was a, that was a pretty decorated lead card to to speak of. You know? Oh yeah. And it just kind of shifted there at the end. But like, who would have thought that a man who just had a heart attack in February would be invisible? well enough to do it? Yeah, because on the other side, this prayers out to to uh, Jim O. Yeah. Who had some issues while he was out there. And yeah, and he's back. He's back. You know, he's he's still fighting right now. I think he had another. Possible yeah, surgery. and I had an operation over the weekend, I believe. Yep. That's yeah, right. That's yeah. Right. yeah. Like so, on Saturday, yeah. like Julian, they, they took him to the hospital and sent Juliana the course or something. Yeah. 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 So she played her semifinal round with him in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I see, you know, just that's what it is. But uh, I mean, they're all fighters. And so I think they'll be great. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We're all thinking about them all the time. Definitely. Well, Mace, I think we're it's time for us to move officially on to the second part of the show. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. I was thinking, you know, we kind of pretty much freestyled this whole kind half free, hour. So. Freestyled the first half hour, but uh, and I don't want your I don't want your impeccable research to go to waste. So, Paul, <laughs> would you go ahead and take it away, please? No, well, we uh, we officially our guest for this evening on episode four is the incredible Sarah Holcomb, and oh. I have a special uh, introduction for her. Oh goodness! Uh, this is our. Yeah, Anyone who comes to the Toronto Island Maple Leaf, they get uh, personalized intros. Uh, and here is a Tim Mull inspired intro for you, my friend. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our next guest to the tea. She's a one time world champ, two time US women's disc golf champ, and the three time MVP of our hearts. She has a passion for cash and that's never clashing with the fashion for spit and hot fire. <laughs> She's the molecular botanist who knows how to tear up a course without trifling the flora. And she teaches us how to beat us with eight inches of curved plastic and pure intestinal fortitude. She's as likely to tickle the ivory with her talented backhand, clean out her on-court ops with her killer overhand, and wipe the field with her trick flick forehand. She's one of the hottest players on tour right now, and she's here to spread the light and the love. Originally hailing from Caldwell, the land of the potato, ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm welcome to Sarah Holcomb. Oh. Hey. That was really good. Oh, look. I'm here. There she is. <laughs> All of a sudden, welcome. Thanks for appearing. Thank with you. Us. I love your intros, dude. They're so, so good. good. Right it's on. so good. It's so good. You have to know. Yeah, he's all about the. Uh, he's all about the uh, research. Mr. Wordsmith. Yeah. The <laughs> oh, well, there's that too. Mr. B. So imagine if you're standing on the tee and you hear that, and now you got to throw, like to start the tournament. Hopefully, I had turned Have my it. music up. <laughs> no actually pro I'm tip, pro I'm tip right there show. just before b starts talking turn the music <laughs> up uh no i would be super stoked you know um that kind of <laughs> intro doesn't ever happen so well no i think you could compete the, the guy in portland that does the the otb and um and the portland open mm -hmm. right he has the his his suits get progressively 
more pimped out at, at each okay. day. So like the first round, he's kind of like subdued. He's wearing like this matching hoodie top and bottom and then by the final day he's wearing like yeah a three-piece suit you it's have like a, a, a john daily style three -piece time suit. announcing like you, you want that's what i'm saying like you still have the words like he just he doesn't have much to say he's that's just right. on the facade right and you he's have all like, style no content yes that's right yes yes, yes. So, and so for, for the yeah. <laughs> for the the, the, the timo we have it's a three-day tournament we do it over the labor day weekend and um I call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the good, I do all the PDJ research, pump your tires, and then I spend the next two days uh, deflating and slashing those tires. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so, so what's it going to take to get you announcing at a at a at a Mace Man event? Let's uh, let's get yeah some, some shoes for the wife for starters. Shoes for the wife. <laughs> shoes Frequent for flyers. Oh, oh. Get her a new handbag. I thought you were talking about the shoes. The shoes. Oh, that's a different. That's the a different shoe. shoe story. This is a completely different shoe story. <laughs> so Mason and I were talking a little bit earlier, and uh, I mean, your resume, your PDJ resume, just if you look on the face of it, it's huge. And I was, I was pointing this, but I did do some research, and I, honestly, I didn't spend as much time as I normally do, but it just pops out. One of the two, two of the amazing things that really popped out about your PDJ resume is. You have two cash streaks that are phenomenal. Mm. From July 14th until July 18th, you had 86 straight caches, including 23 wins over that period. You had one tournament where you missed the cash, and then you went back on the horse, and you got 79 straight caches with 18 mm. wins, including up until this year when you had a slight little burpee there at the... Um, was the DGPT doubles, I believe, is where you missed the cash. But um, yeah, and that's not even a real event. That's not, not even a real event. Yeah, oh, here we go. Throw those titles out. Throw those titles out. Yes. It's so, still going. It was like the All Star Weekend or something. It's not even right. a real event. Yeah. The casting so, streak is alive. So you're hammered all weekend long. You're wearing the Sorry. straw hat. You don't care. You're with the big foam sunglasses. It's all <laughs> novelty business. I get it. But no, honestly, seriously, you you are like amazing competitor, an amazing successful player. Uh, and Mace was was questioning. He's known you for a little while. He's known yes. that you are a bit of a competitive person. Did this competitive nature of yours manifest itself first in your volleyball skills, or did it does it go back even earlier? I think it's with my older brothers. Honestly, I had two older brothers. You know, that sets you up as a girl and you have two older brothers. Just a like, dumb that sets girl. You up. Yeah, I got to keep up. And so all your life, you've just been battling hard against two older, most likely more, less aerodynamic hey, brothers. I met, I met hey, one dude, 6'8", 6'4". Hey, <laughs> hey, <laughs> I'm the little one in my family. I met one of them. But yeah. you were the... You were the one that was setting all-time volleyball records at George Washington University. Don't get yourself there. You know, you know, it took a summer on the beach playing volleyball in Hawaii to get me good at volleyball. Is that what it was, really? Yeah. I mean, I was good, but I was raw. You know, I was, like, powerful and intense and worked hard, but my skills were not great until a summer in Hawaii taking organic chemistry, summer school, trying to get that class out of the way, and beach volleyball every day after after summer school wow and then i came back a completely different player um yeah That's awesome. i ended up all american um and now i'm in the george washington hall of fame mm. yeah, nice. you are. It's available online for those who are uh, applying their diligent research skills of course <laughs> i mean it's actually on the first page of google when you when you put in sarah Hope. Is, it, is it on the wikipedia yeah, uh no i don't think so no maybe the I mean, Hall of Fame thing is on on the first page of the of the Google splash. Page. Oh, it is. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Cool. Breaking yeah, the I algorithm. Like, I, flew to, I flew to Washington D.C. and had to give a speech in front of all these amazing people, and I was super nervous. That's awesome. But it was like it was like three years ago I got inducted. That's awesome. It's pretty cool. So you got your master's at George Washington, is that right? I got my. I have two bachelors at George Washington. I got my master's in Missouri. Okay. Yeah. And essentially since discovering how awesome you are at this golf you've kind of put all those things on hold to put the pedal to the metal and see what you can get out of the game i would 
would say putting them on hold is kind of, um, it's, it's kind of, I would say that's not the, the way I think about it. I think about those as like little things that I've done in my life and now I've moved on to other things. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like as much as I may not, like people might say, oh, you have these degrees, why don't, it's such a shame that you don't use them. Um, well, tuition wasn't so much back then. <laughs> by the way so <laughs> a little different perspective <laughs> but also like I learned so much doing those things regardless of whether I'm actually like like completely applying you know my education to what I do now but you know those are just this points in life and now I'm on this journey that's all evolution like that's your personal evolution absolutely yeah it's yeah. Uh, I have no regrets about getting you know doing what I've done and experiencing those things and those are great and they've taught they've given me you know, really subtle tools um, in other ways to apply to what my new passions are. Are there times where you're maybe playing or if you're teaching a clinic or if you're interacting with people, do you draw on your teaching experience or your academic experience? I couldn't not, you know, I mean, it's part of who I am, you know, so everything I've done before this shapes everything I'm doing now. So, I mean, absolutely, you know, I mean, I mean, I can't give you like exactly like, well, I'm using this philosophy of education. No to teach this particular you know i'm not going to define it you know but i know it's there you mean you're not using dewey on a daily basis <laughs> uh, hey she's not afraid to Close talk bubbles. in front of the entire <laughs> class she's not afraid to talk in front of the entire class at whatever level she needs to to get their attention trust yeah. me i've seen it plenty of times you know i always told a lot of really bad jokes you know and it worked so <laughs> <laughs> now do you when it comes to the social media side as we as you guys already referenced earlier today um this evening the social media dimension is going to become a much more uh, important vector in disc golf personalities and disc golf players and pros do you ever pay attention to what people like the comments, the chatter, the online internet buzz? Do you ever read those things? Do you ever follow those things? Well, that's a great question. So it's important to engage with your followers. So to a point, like, especially on TikTok and Instagram, I definitely interact. And then on Facebook, when I post, I post a lot less on Facebook nowadays. Um, but when I do post on Facebook, I do try to respond to, especially like questions, you know, like if they're just like, cool and they give me a fist bump i don't usually respond to that but like if you have a question about something or something that's interesting for me to like respond to and i do try to respond on those where i draw the line and i have a guilty pleasure that i have to resist all the time is when i'm on coverage right so youtube coverage oh yeah yeah so that's a guilty pleasure because like when i have a really good round sometimes I'll get on and I'll watch some of the round and I'll look at the comments and see, did they think I did good? You know? Um, but at the same time, at those same times, I've come across comments that are just super like awful and nasty so and awesome. savage, you know? So that's the thing that I have to really um, resist is like getting on those types <clears throat> of platforms and looking at the comments sure. to validate my own abilities. Right. Like it's like, oh, they see that throw in on four. It was so cool. Oh, oh, somebody noticed or whatever. Like that's the kind of thing that like is really easy to suck yourself into for your own ego. Um, and I think that that's the part where I resist and I'm pretty good at resisting it nowadays. Yeah, we don't talk to trolls. That's the basic like byline It's like bottom line is like we're we're all for interacting with fans. But like if you don't have anything positive to say. For the most part, we don't. Have yeah, it. and even on my best rounds, like what I was telling you prior, like when I will go in and look at comments, like there'll there'll be there'll be like twelve or you know there'll be a bunch of like maybe eighty percent really positive comments, mm -hmm. but then there'll be some somebody says something really rude and nasty and just like whoa, yeah. you know what are you talking about? Like that's mm -hmm. not even that's not even close to true, you know. But or like, you know, like sexual or yeah, they like oh, yeah, yeah, stuff. yeah. Then there's all that stuff yeah, crap. exactly so um so inevitably even on my best rounds there's always really negative it's stuff yeah. so i just avoid it yeah yeah i don't i don't even look at it and i hope that people who know me or care about me as a player <laughs> will go in and to be like yo that's like totally wrong but i will say that like thank you for everybody that has the positive stuff to say yeah because like that that's the stuff that we can uh really connect with fans we meet so many people that are coming to disc signings and things like that and they, they love the content 
and uh, they are, they have something positive to say about it. And so we really just want to focus on them. Yeah. And in general, like just for people making comments, like if you don't have something nice to say, like you don't have to say it. Like, yeah. Nobody's forcing you. Yeah. And also like the end game of all of this, like I need to tell this person they're terrible at something is we're not going to interact with fans. You know, you're going to lose. I'm going to have to stop looking at comments of other things. You know, at least now I can still interact on my Instagram and my mm -hmm. TikTok and my Facebook, you know, but if it gets to the point where it's super toxic, like I'm just going to post and I'll either turn off the comments or I just won't ever read them, yeah. you know, and you'll but never have access to any of the people that you wish you did. Mm -hmm. And right now we still are at a point where you have access to most of the top professionals. Yeah. It's, so it's, if we want to keep it that way, like, let's just be nice to each other. Be respectful. Like, you know, there's no point in posting your negative stuff on someone else's stuff. Well, and like, I don't even know if this is the right place for it, but like just respect the spaces that a lot of these players live in, right? Because there's a lot of stuff that's been going on with people um, walking up to players' vans that might have a door open or like the window open. And they're really not like inviting individuals in. But like uh, they're trying to get fresh air, like it's hot in vans in, yeah. the, in the summer. Yeah. So you have to open your doors, you have yeah. to open your windows, you got to blow the fans hard and then it's, 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 you know, livable. But, you know, but that doesn't mean that I want you to randomly poke your head in my door say, and say up? like, hey, yeah, hey, these, Sarah, what's up? These are, I'm like, oh, uh, I'm just relaxing, yeah. trying to. These are the, it's like somebody are, poking their head in your front door and just being like, what's up? If you had a what's window up, open in your house and somebody pokes your head, their head in your window, that's not going to be okay. But these, like all these, the way these in too. are these players sanctuaries. This is where they go to like wind, wind down. So please. And like I say, this might, have, might, might not be the best, best place for it, but be respectful of uh, these players' spaces. Well, absolutely. Well, I, don't, I don't think that there's a problem with that. I don't think that, that, that this is- It's been happening this, a this lot. This is a fun place. Again, you're not, you're, not, you're not throwing anybody under the bus and you're not no. ripping anybody to shreds, but people need to understand that and people need to know. I mean, like I, yeah. I saw yeah. James Conrad interview last summer after he threw in the shot and he said exactly what you're saying. Yeah. And- and he's like, listen, give me a chance to get away from the van. Give me a chance to get mm -hmm. up and get, you know, start my day. Maybe talk to me at the first tee or somewhere like in the parking lot. But don't just come over and invade my personal space because this is yeah. all the space I've got. Yeah. It's 19 feet long. And you know, the yeah. first five feet of that are not really usable unless you're driving. Yeah, no, you're you're right. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I think there's a there's a balance because like like she said, we love yeah, to interact. No, with we the love fans. it, but if it, it becomes really overwhelming do. and like it's yeah, if it becomes a negative situation, this it's just gonna you know it's like it's gonna you're gonna ruin what disc golf is so unique about is like you yeah. know being able to have access to the best players and you know go like chat with them randomly. Yep. You know you don't get to do that in other sports. No, there's but we can still period. do it here and we yeah. can keep it that way if we're all on the same page. And how long do you like? the way that disc golf is growing, the way that the momentum is building, the way the evolution, the, the wave is, has been going, it seems in one direction. One can only imagine that we're going to get eventually to that point with other sports, to the point where you personally, Sarah, you may have to have a tour manager, you may have to have a PR per agent, you may have to have those things. What are you talking about? That's Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are for doing good sure. at yeah. Instagram yeah. videos. Yeah, no, people He's have to. charge the social media for sure. Have. There are, there are several like um, branding management agencies out there right now that are mm -hmm. trying to recruit players and, you know, like Beacon just signed Isaac who just went Idlewild, yep. you know, I mean, they're, they're all grass, like they're all like, who knows if they're any good, you know, no, they haven't, no, nobody's proven themselves in that industry mm -hmm. yet, um, but they're starting to come in there and trying to make ways. Okay, so this is like here we work are. Up. It's happening. 2022, you know, in the next five years, it might just be the fact that we can't talk to you directly we have to talk our agent to your agent hopefully not friend. i mean yeah. uh that better not happen not with you two no, and me i mean no, there's a different connection here call my people yeah. uh no. they'll be fine yeah, well, <laughs> no, look, there'll be no more like, hockey games if you start getting like that note, on a side note we're going to see bert kreischer in south carolina during just after usdgc and so like we're trying to like get in touch with his people Right. To make a round happen because okay, he's so well, big in his disc golf, right? But yeah. well, we have to go through these channels. We got to talk to the right people. We're like, how, which, I might what know do we, the channel. What do we say to get him to pay attention? Yeah. I might know the channel. 
I think Mace okay. handles the channel. Yeah. We need to talk. We, we, yeah, the two, the three, the four of us really, well. Yeah. You guys little, just there's stay a, on there's the air next after week. hours thing that we do in 11 <laughs> minutes that you guys missed out on a couple weeks ago. But, um, but, the, we, but there's a, a, we need to talk like real soon. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah. because uh, okay. I'm, yeah, the there's some stuff in the works. And it's not it. necessarily 100% just that, but there's like, yeah. like, uh, the Easter eggs. Area. Area. I'm going to take Bert Kreischer on a glow round after his show. You got to get mushrooms for that for sure, though. Hundred <laughs> percent. I'm sorry. Did I say? Mm. Are we still yeah. recording? Yeah, we'll just cook up some morels. Yeah, some um, portobello. With portobello. A little, with a little chicken, spinach and some chicken of the world. sausage. Shiitake. Yeah, allegedly. Let that allegedly. shiitake go, man. Oh, that's so good. That's so, hilarious. Before we before we do uh, head into the afters, a um, couple of things that I just wanted to kick tick touch on here just regarding your your fan base um a couple of comments that i wanted to pull out one of them one person was very um assertive in saying that you are one of the most solid announcers in disc golf that we mm. have seen and that they think your track to future stardom is going to be as a commentator after your playing career is kind of you know mm -hmm. on the biggest stage this person loves it when you show on a, up on a broadcast. What's it like for you to be on the air? I mean, this is, we're on the air now, but when you're at a tournament and you're asked to commentate, what's that like for you? You know, it's really, it's a challenge. It's really, it's a really fun challenge for me, right? Um, Cause I, I get to interact. Like I always contact all the players of the, you know, of the show, the video I'm watching course, yeah. and I try to make sure I know what their bag is. And then I know them anyway. Right. So it's really just a matter of trying to like get really good information out in a concise way. Um, and then also like following along with the card, like how many strokes they're taking and making sure that I'm creating a storyline, um, you know, mm -hmm. but it's also a massive shift from the mindset that I use as a player. It's almost ex polar opposites, to be mm -hmm. honest. You know, and you're building this storyline and talking about past and future as a commentator, but as a player, just trying to only stay in the present, mm -hmm. you know, so I think it's really difficult to be a really good commentator and also play at a super high level. I think that those mind frames, because oftentimes at these events, when you're doing both, you have to switch from the morning, like I'm a commentator, I'm talking about this big picture stuff, I'm trying to create a storyline, you know, yada, yada. And then, you know, you have one hour. And then you got to go tee off and you have to switch your brain to doesn't matter about any of these things that I was thinking about for the last three hours. I have to just like be present, play the shots as mm -hmm. they are. And like, I think it's a pretty difficult shift. Yeah. So, you know, I have a lot of respect for, you know, um, Jerem and Yuli um, and, and Nate and some of those commentators that are able to like switch back and forth. But we also really haven't seen a commentator be a extremely high level player and also be a great commentator. Mm -hmm. right. You know, you don't see the two go mm -hmm. in hand in hand. Well, and you can thing. even see like, as some of these great commentators in the sport have risen to their, their level, you can also kind of track their play. And it has not necessarily, I'm not gonna say it goes down, but it, it seems like yeah. it goes down. I'm sure there's mm -hmm. metrics to probably show that, yeah. but it seems as though, you know, that's a really hard combination. No, you're, I, I think you nailed it on the head there. I mean, you if you're going to be a top level player, you have to be that's what your focus is. You mm -hmm. can't you can't be a player slash something else. That's also your best in both. Like you can't be a player promoter yeah. or a player tournament no. director or we haven't seen it. Yeah. yeah. And I've actually turned down a, a lot of commentary this year because it's like you want to do commentary at this major. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm trying to win that. <laughs> you know, I was like, let's do, I'll do commentary when I'm like, at a, like I'm in Emporia where I have no chance to win ever a tournament ever, you know, or like some place that like is like windy and long. Yeah. I'll do commentary there, but the rest of them, like, I'm like, yeah, I don't like, but if I'm really, if I really feel like I have a chance to win a tournament or it's a big high level tournament, like I can't be shifting my focus like that. At least right now. Yeah. But I do hope that um, the little bit that I've been able to put in the couple, like, you know, it's been, I've probably been doing it for four or five years randomly. You know, I was part of the first groups of the D Steve Dodge pro tour commentary. Um, yeah. So um, 
you know, I'm hoping that the little bit I've done now and then the little bit I'll continue to do will set me up for something that I can do after I can't find one. So you, a lot of the, a lot of the, that you're doing is post-production, isn't it? Or are you doing it live as well? All of it. All of it. Now I have had a stint doing on course commentary, similar to what like Nate Perkins has done and, um, Brian Earhart. Brian Earhart. Yeah. He's really good. I, at women's nationals last year, I was injured and I did on course commentary there. Um, but it was still in the end of it. Like it was in the beginning stages of the on course commentary. So I don't think, you know, they were still trying to learn how to cut to the person and mm -hmm. like ask other questions other than how's the vibe out there. What does it look like down there where you're at? <laughs> well, so, okay. And that's a whole nother topic. That, I mean, like yeah. that's, the, yeah, we can do a whole show a lot about now. that. It looks so, good. But I um, hope, you know, I, mean, I was we, totally down for live commentary. We, we, uh, I mean, we learned, we were, learned a few things ourselves on Saturday, you know, and so, <laughs> so, you know, I'm not going to, uh, uh, but one of the things I'm going to ask you about before we jump out of this whole thing, um, I talked to somebody recently who was there and he caddied and he's an influential person in the game and he said some things to me and about, uh, about the women's nationals and about the way the course was set up. And I mean, it looked like it was set up to score, like, yeah. you, like, yeah. like, maybe almost to a point where like i personally never cared for the you got to shoot 10 or 11 down to to do well here i but i i mean you know i'm not necessarily like everybody else either but so i want to know i want to know what you thought about that about the way because i mean i i did watch a lot of that and um and you know so, it was, i mean that obviously um, that event was awesome for you know for ladies yeah. generally speaking as well and 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 so it also reminded me like i saw if you guys throw a few shots and i was like Oh, I forgot how much I love Token Creek. I mean, it's just a sweet yeah. place to play. I mean, and yeah. it's just yeah. like, okay, now I got to go back to Wisconsin again too, you know? And But anyways, go ahead. I want to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, so I think that um, on the Pro Tour, uh, most of the women are used to seeing um, the top women can get most of the holes. Maybe there's one or two they can't get, but they can get 16 out of 18. The average throwers can only get probably... 10 or 11, maybe 12 out of the 18, you know, and if you don't throw far at all, you could, you can get less than half the course on birdies. Right. So this is the average pro tour environment that we're dealing with. Right. At, um, the women's nationals, um, I, as an average thrower, you know, I represent my distance represents close to 70, 75% of the field, maybe even 80% of the field. There's like 20% that throw way farther than everyone. And then there's 80% of the field. I represent the 80%. And there was only two or three holes per course that I couldn't get a birdie on unless I threw like an 80 footer in or something like don't have access to basically. Um, and so I think what we're seeing is this incredible ability for more people to score instead of our 20 percenters just out throwing everyone. And then over the course of three or four rounds, they have so many more strokes because their upshots were that much closer so many more times and, or, they had, you know, six or seven more birdie looks per round mm -hmm. than the average player, mm -hmm. you know, so you give them those looks, they get 10, you know, you get 25%, 30% of those that's, you know, two or three more birdies per round than uh, the 80%. And I think on the pro tour, we see that, you know, the 80 percenters can do it if they play perfect. Um, but most of the time you're going to see the 20 percenters um, on the lead cards. But at this layout, because the 80 percenters had access to most of the holes, we saw a lot of parity. We saw mm -hmm. a bunch of new faces up there and we saw <laughs> some of the distance throwers not on the lead card all the mm -hmm. time. Um, and also it was some of the most interesting golf that the women's division has seen in years. Well, you know, yeah, like, and, you know and like, I mean, when Valerie came from the, the third card, right, the second chase. So, I mean, and, and that was it was fun to watch. It was really fun to watch. And and it's, you know, unfortunately, well, it's really yeah, it's so much of it. Sinanda goes out there and just bogey free the first three to the first three rounds. Yeah. And you get there and for, first off, you get there and the distance throwers, like the 20 percenters are like, whoa, this is super short. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the field is like, cool, I can get some birdies, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, it's like on the men's side, you know, that's you know, 80% of the field can get most of the birdies and there's 20% that can get those extra few, the Eagles. you yeah. know, but on the women's side, it's, this is skewed so much differently because they just really emphasize distance mm -hmm. on our course design more so 
um, to the point where the most of the field can't get to the holes. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, so, you know, it's basically like, <laughs> That's a really cool picture behind you there. Hey, yo. <laughs> I was wondering when you were going to pick up on that. I look confused. I'm like, oh my, I, I look surprised. Like, <laughs> that, that, that was the picture from your dish yeah. signing last night. Yeah, that picture is so old. It is very old picture. The big like fair faucet curls. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I feel yeah. like you're 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 uh, you're inviting us to Hogwarts, the disc golf version of Hogwarts. There. You know? <sighs> yeah. I, I choose Hufflepuff. Yeah. There's the one. There's the logo. This yeah. I just before we uh, before we finish our episode today uh, officially, I just want to point out this is your logo. This is the Sarah Holcomb it's on the band uh, to uh, tour gear swag apparel logo, and it's incredible. I a little bit of a self taught graphic designer, but spent a lot of time just you know making my own golf disc designs and whatnot, and that is one of the most amazing yeah. things I've seen in like. Sick. When I when I first saw Avery Jenkins logo, I thought, "Wow, mm -hmm. that's incredible! This is better." And I Avery is one of my Ooh. best friends. Well, Justin Lago is the one that did it, um, and it's available. You can get that exact logo on a cool black hat on my website at sarahokum.com. We got some in person, and we also have some of these t-shirts. Yep, yep. t-shirts and tank tops. Yep, yep. Um, and there's a brand new wrap on the van, so. If you yeah, see we basically out. just pimped the van out in all of those colors and that logo and um, go to TikTok to check it out. Yeah, and, we just and Instagram. It. That's your latest Instagram. Instagram right? too. Yeah, and it looks really, really nice. It's really super nice. fun. Ravens on there. Yeah, it's got like there's some nice. there's some star constellations. There's some hidden stuff you got. to Yeah, it so some yeah, we did a lot. Is there any Christmas light clips on it? No, <laughs> no, the clips are in the van still. Well, I put two clips in the van. They clipped the me day. twice the other day. And it's been a long time since we clipped. And she just had oh, them sit on supposed to talk about it. Didn't talk to me about it. <laughs> yeah. Are these, are these your colors, Sarah? Is that is that your yeah, color? Yeah, that scheme of, yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. That's it's right. Really Teal, cool. pink, blue, purple. Yeah. yeah. Just the like gradient. Damn, if I ever had a pro sports team in my town that would have had those colors, I'd be rocking it 24 7. <laughs> right? <laughs> Absolutely. they're all my favorites altogether. that's my jam so thank you guys thank you so much for being part of episode four uh the special guest sarah uh <laughs> we wish you i know you're our intrepid uh, one half of the intrepid tour reporter team but uh, we wanted to officially have you on to like bring you into the fold for those people who may not know you and we didn't want to take anybody for for granted and um thanks for checking in chris it's always amazing to see you Definitely. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you. We're, More we're road gonna, reports coming. We're going to have you as well as a special guest. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to confirm with you, but uh, we want to be able to also highlight you. We spent yeah. a good half hour talking specifically about Sarah, but uh, also at the same time, we want to throw the spotlight over on you. But Yeah, no, going. for sure. And real quick, before we drop off, Sarah is winning the road rivalry record. She's up 31 to 29 and 1. Oh, so it's still super tight. Nice. I was wondering yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah. I smoked him tonight. She though. Beat me like six times. <laughs> so I got so I got a buddy that I got a buddy that's been dragging me out to play a lot lately. You might have met him. His name's Pat. But um, up until the last two times we went to um, to uh, oh, Founders, he mm -hmm. couldn't. He, I just I just I was playing bad. He was playing worse. I was playing oh, great. <laughs> He was playing. He was playing great. I was playing better. You know, I mean, like I shot a yeah. eight with twelve birdies the other day. And he's like, man, oh. I just can't catch up. You know, but he got me twice over there. So I mean, it's like I've been. It's kind of like that, except for I, I, he doesn't know there's a rivalry. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he, but however, he is battling. And like we went out Wednesday, we went out Saturday and played Louisville, and he got me by two. And I made, I missed a couple of putts. I mean, like stupid short putts, you know, and just totally in my head and everything. But it's just funny because I also just keep telling myself, oh, yeah, it's just exercise. It's just exercise. Dude, next, next He's time. He's like, I'm trying to reel you in. I'm trying to reel you in. I'm like, Next time ahead. you're going to hit him with the numbers and be like, you know, we're three and two right now, yeah, right? Yeah, you got to hit him. <laughs> yeah. But like, so, I, yeah, we're, we're going out. We're going to try to. It's not gonna we happen. are not going to do we're that. Gonna do no, that. we're headed to the Asabo River to go camp on a remote peninsula we're going to be um, disconnected from like, without internet for internet five days everything it's going to be great nice. good in for Michigan. you when does that start tomorrow, tomorrow. oh right on cool nice. like five days and so. then deglow is the week after um 
So I'm actually, a lot of people are in Europe right now for the European Open. The President's Cup starts tomorrow. Go USA, USA, USA. So President's Cup tomorrow, Cat and Paige are going to lock it down. And I have no doubt that Ricky and Paul will do their thing. Well, yeah, because Tatar just dropped. So that means Henna is going to step up. And Tatar has an elbow injury that she's still nursing. She's out of the European Open, out Not of the right. President's Cup. Not Evelina right. and Henna are the men's are the women's uh, the side, women's and side. then uh, that like uh, yeah. I mean, Albert Tam is on the men's side. He's won a tournament this year in the U.S. Nibo right. is the, and he's the, and he's showed well too. His name's been up at the top a couple of times. Besides, yeah, yeah. yeah. but I don't think they got a chance. America's going to win. No offense, Europe. Yeah. I really do like you guys, but we're gonna win. Yep. And then the European Open, man, um, James Conrad has had a hot had a hot finish in Sula. He's been playing pretty good. Barsby just won Sula Open, right? So he, you know, even though he's lower rated by twenty points than the winners, that than the top the top ranked players, he still you know he plays great in Europe. He's basically like he might as well be European. He's right at home over there. Yeah. Um, and that's a big thing about Europe is being comfortable over there because it takes the travel is pretty brutal and they just everything's different, right? Yeah. So um, Paige and Kat are going to battle it out, I think. Evelina and Henna could totally battle them. We'll see yeah. how they're playing. So, Kat yeah. just won recently at Idlewild. Paige hasn't won in the last like three or four weeks. It's been a minute. And she's had two really bad finishes in the last two tournaments. Yeah. She has Evelina, definitely had some struggles. Yeah, yep. and Evelina just figured out her putt again and started to play really good at women's yep. nationals. Yep, yep, yep. Um, and yeah, Hannah um, did, good. did yeah. good too. So I think that the women's side, we'll see who shows up those days, but the four of them are going to battle. And it's then on the men's right. side, Paul McBeth has, has, has won the European never, Open yeah. the last like five years. Five in a row. Five in a row. Yeah, but he also has had a bad season. You know, so I, I mean, to win a sixth, on a bad season, I think uh, like Ricky Conrad. Um, yeah, I um, think Ricky's got to be one of the front runners. Like, yeah. um, even Heinberg's there. Yeah, I don't know. It's gonna be it's gonna be cool to watch. I'm excited. It starts in two days. Yeah. So yeah. that so keep looking out for all so that. How are you gonna be watching that when you're five days without signal? I ain't We're watching not. it. We're not watching it. <laughs> Post production. <laughs> I'm just all for five days. It's gonna be an hour. But then all those people coming back from Deglo are gonna be tired, jet lagged. They partied in Europe all like for two weeks, and they gotta come play toboggan, Mister Up and Down the Hills. Oh, bomb, yeah. Bomb. I've yeah. been, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been. So I'd be looking yeah. for a winner from those for those for that event from someone who didn't go to Europe. Nice inside tips. Right I heard there, that right? already right before you said it. <laughs> yeah that's been the underlying message for about the last seven minutes <laughs> yeah well whatever <laughs> i'm not saying i'm gonna win it like i'm just gonna try and play good but yeah I'm right just, on well but i mean that's that's not it gonna might happen. it's not gonna hurt your i your wanted process. before there you go but um yeah i'm on the bag we're gonna win it yeah he is gonna win <laughs> there you go I like yeah. look at the focus so, in his we're eyes gonna win something even if it's just satisfaction yeah so in terms of europe it seems to me like i've i've been around i've been playing since the early 90s and i remember and i think it was 98 was the first culture clash that stokely arranged and that was the first of the you know the team the events uh usa versus team europe mm. and at the time it seemed like such a big deal to get a small core of americans to go over to europe Mm. And, and there may be like I think maybe Ron Russell might have gone to Sweden once to play. Like it was very rare. It was more. I don't know like, about that. I I don't think he did. I think he was reluctant to go anywhere except I for think, like I know he went to Puerto Rico and he's gone to a couple other places, but maybe I'm wrong. I just remember Ron all of a sudden like lecturing me on how to pronounce the S O K in or however whatever the, the particular linguistic construction is in Swedish, and he's like, "What, Shalstrom? You're telling." Ron, you're telling me? Okay. <laughs> you, can only, you can only get that from being on the ground, you know what I'm saying? But, but nowadays, it seems like like Europe is totally on the map, totally worth it, totally worth for a large coterie of international players to go over there and play. And, I mean, you... you yeah, can, I would disagree with you a little bit, although I think it's really helpful for European players to come over here. Yeah. Like I went over to Europe a couple years in a row and 
And you did it's well. It's really expensive over there. And the payouts are not very good. Okay. Um, and, you know, you're dealing with a lot of travel, especially since COVID, you're dealing with a lot of travel stuff that is not simple. And, you know, I, when I, every time I went over there, I had to like rent a car, rent an Airbnb, get an Airbnb. Like you're driving on, you know, you're driving on roads that have completely different road signs that, you know, that stuff, the regular stuff you're used to here, like the yeah. indications of where you can pass and where you can park and what is a one lane versus a two lane versus a one way versus a yada. yada. That's not, you know, they, and they don't make you pass a test to rent a car. <laughs> okay. you, just, you just got an American driver's license. You get a car. Let's hey, you, go. You're still you with know? us. You, you survived the roads. I found it very challenging over there um, to the point where uh, I played the beast a couple of times. I don't need to go over and play that. The money isn't that great. The only reason I would really go over there if COVID wasn't so such a hassle would be to build my brand. Mm. you know like the beast they don't put women's tees out so for me particular like it's like it's old school disc golf for me like it's not it's not being female friendly at all right. um they don't and if you talk to females in europe they're like when we talk about short tees they're just like what why would we do that you know they just like this they just cannot it just cannot conceptualize it you know um so you know it's like it's not my cup of tea although i would love to connect with the european fans you know, and get to know some of those folks and play some of the courses over there that are not on the tour. Um, it's not, but that's not worth it, especially in the middle of the summer when you got back to back weekends that you got to play this and they got to travel and come back. And like, if I could travel over there for a little while, like three or four weeks, that's different. Yeah. Um, you know, if there's like a stretch over there, right. that would be way different, but one tournament and come right back. Mm -mm. No. No, that's too that's too rigorous on this travel schedule. Yeah, you'd have to. That's, not, that's way too short a turn, no matter what. I mean, if you're yeah. going totally. that far on a plane, you need to spend two weeks some wherever you at went. At least, yeah. And by that time, by the I time mean, you get there, after two weeks, you're still you're barely acclimated. Yeah, yeah. That's I'm not going to the side of the earth for less than two weeks. Yeah, and I mean, I see it in the Euros every year when they come over to the U.S. as well. Like it does, it takes a while for them to get into their groove and actually play the game that they're used to playing. So to yeah. go over there for just like a week or two and then come right back, it's just yeah. it. Well, you me, know, there was a long, long time where Americans, uh, where North Americans, I should say, went to Europe and didn't have it have much success. You know, mm -hmm. and I mean, even I've talked back in the day. Kenny said that, you know, that it was like he felt like it was him against them. The first couple of times he went over there and he didn't do well like he did well once and then the second time the i don't remember who it was but the second time i think he lost to, to like the european champion and like they he said that it felt like they really went even crazier for that person you know and, mm -hmm. and like he yeah just i mean standing there on an island by himself which yeah you know i mean i'm I sure that that I kind of thing is that now is like, um, I was over there five or six years ago everyone was super kind Right. Like they were super excited to meet all the American players. And I didn't feel like, yeah, they're going to root for their hometown heroes as they should. Um, but I didn't feel like they weren't welcoming. I really do think that the European crowd is is really good. They're a really good yeah. crowd. You know, and I'm talking about 20, 25 years ago, too. I'm not talking totally. about just like. Totally. I think it's yeah, changed. Like UC has made a big impact true. over there with all the courses. And, you know, it's like Finland's national sport. You know, like, <laughs> so yeah. it's the, the culture has certainly changed maybe since then. And also, I think it's a great culture. You know, I think that they've really embraced the sport. So it's cool. And that's that's why I'd want to go over there. But, you know, maybe next year I'll just go over there and go play other stuff and not play the European Open. <laughs> <laughs> go meet all the people. That's what I want to do. Well, you definitely you touched on the side about uh, building your brand. And I mean, that's. That's something if you can if you can build into your professional schedule paid appearances because you've built your brand as a you know disc golf player, but also as a disc golf personality, as a disc golf educator, that's like the dream. If you could be flown around, you know. I mean, right now Avery gets to fly out to Montenegro to put a course in the ground. Wouldn't it be great for Sarah and Chris to get flown out to, you know, France to lead a week long worth we of we kind of got some insight on this at a music festival and they told you about what your future is. oh yeah <laughs> well, we don't need to go. 
I had a tarot card reading. Yeah, no, that's a whole other one. <laughs> and the lady said I was meant to travel the world and speak to people. About this girl. No, she didn't about say your career. About your career. Yeah, no, she, she did. She straight up pulled the world card and then this other card. And, like, Which I think and then we both got a lump in our throat at the same time. And she's like, I feel like you're supposed to speak to the world. But that's, us, yeah. And travel that's and I don't know. Anyway. Wow. There's, there's a place Long for story it. short. There's a place for it. That we'll was see. some cool action right there, though. Right? It was cool. It was, it was good. Yeah. yeah. So speaking of crystal balls, Mace, now that we are in the after hours, you uh, you have got some info to drop regarding uh, some things coming up? Well, it's there. I had a really, really long and great conversation with Jonathan Poole the other day about the uh, about the vendor area and about my role in the vendor area and slash our role in the vendor area. And we started the conversation with, um, well, I told him that I wanted to do like the Tuesday before the week before, I think the Tuesday, the week before when I first get to Rock Hill is the, is the, the logical Tuesday on the schedule, but I could be wrong about that. But then I was telling him, I was going, yeah, I think we're thinking about doing one that weekend, the week of the event as well. And so he kept on talking and he goes, well, he goes, you know, you'll be up and running by then and things will be firing on all cylinders, which I feel like we're in a lot better shape than we were, you know, two weeks ago, obviously. And, you know, a month ago too. But basically my one of my roles is going to be to drive the vibe all week in there. And so um, I'm really trying to figure out a lot of things that can be done. Now, obviously, um, names have been dropped and I'm not going to do any of that right now because who knows what's up exactly and mm -hmm. what's going to happen along, along that line. But, um, but I've been told that we could have a band out there. I mean, like last year, we, there was no noise complaints and I'm actually thinking about possibly seeing if we can't get a band on, on, you know, Thursday night, Friday night and Saturday night. And, and then KJ on the, on the DJ. Well, we could do him too. Or we could have him one of those yeah. nights. As Dude, opposed to a band. He's been killing it. Yeah, that's totally, I'm totally down with that too. And so that, but that's part of what I wanted to talk to you about. It's like one of the things that I've been talking about, and I'm not sure what the incarnation of this is going to be, but we're going to do if, well, if I have my way about it, we're going to have a putting contest every day for players and for spectators. Mm -hmm. And, and then we're going to gather people on Saturday night, like probably the top three or top five from each day, depending on how, probably maybe only top three from each day from each side and then come in and beat it all down. And then whoever wins on the pro side and whoever wins on the spectator side, they get to go. The spectators ultimate prize is going to get be to go head to head with the winner on the pro side. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that'll, you know, I mean, I think I don't, I'm not going to say it's a player's party or anything like that, but I think it might right. have, there's things that we can do to get, keep people there, including having a band, including having KJ play or whatever. So think about it. I mean, obviously you don't have to give up answers now. There's no, you know, like 10 weeks from now, but, yep. but that being said, I'm open to suggestions and. Um, well, KJ is my first for sure. I think it's going to be awesome. Reach out, reach out to KJ and see if he wants to, he wants to DJ something and what night would work for him. Yep. Yada, yada. Cause I think, I think like not only, you know, he's pretty good at what he does and we enjoy it his last show we went to mm -hmm. um and people love him he's yeah. cool he's he's you know he's a disc golfer doing his thing like on his hobby you know so sure. i think there's a lot of value there mm -hmm. well and so and and then to be clear on that too i'm not i'm saying i want this whole thing to kick off when the last putt kicks off i'm not saying that it, everybody comes back at eight like yeah yeah so it's just, it's just i want that vibe to, to, to be cards it's gonna be a little tough <laughs> yeah. yeah no exactly so I think it should actually cater to players a little bit more. And, and plus I want them to want to come there because, and, and I don't know this, now this is for sure not any, anywhere in the gospel truth yet, but I'm hoping that that will be the official playoff or to putting contest for the championship too. Mm -hmm. And so if that's the case, then, then there's lure to the players because there'll be a payout. Yeah. And uh -huh. so, and so that being said, that's, and so like he also said, he goes, you can have a show every day if you want. Yeah, I think, uh, I think having music every day after, right after the final putt, like as soon as the final putt hits the ground, hits Thanks. the basket, start the music, yeah. regardless of what it is. Maybe it's just a DJ. You have a DJ start and then you have a band well, we're gonna, 
our, we're gonna have heck yeah in that area full time too yeah so oh, but, he has to drop the bait he has to drop the base as soon as the putt drops and then i think you know maybe you have a band coming on in like an hour you know or you have kj coming on an hour after the last one you know or something or something something to that effect you know where you immediately get people engaged in this like dance party going on over here where they can go get food and drinks and you know like be in a space that is a bunch of other disc golfers also enjoying you know the the come down after that's the idea that's everybody exactly, that's exactly the idea is so i want i want i want right? people to <laughs> want to come over there so, yeah. so now yeah. it's over there as in not by the final hole putt right not exactly. by 18. so that's it's the hard not, part it's going right? to be by it's seven get everybody to filter back to the stage which is going to be on the other side by the um vendor vendor village that's which correct. is that's going to be yeah. the vendor village yeah yeah so i mean as long as the music is loud enough <laughs> well and it's not just i mean it's not just going to be a word of mouth thing either it'll be published and yeah yeah and well so of course but like it's you know audi auditorily you know people are either going to go to their cars or they're going to go to the music because they're not going to go to vendor village to get food they're going to go somewhere else to get food. for sure you know, get in their car and it'll quick. be the It'll be the it'll be the spectators that are going to the vendor village to get food if that's what's going on. Yeah, but there, if there's music, if there's something for them to go to. Be, well, and there will be food. There will be food and beer there too. So. So pair that with some disc signings. You know, have like five or six players per. Like as soon as the final drop, you know, you've got this these tents set up. You've got the players sitting there. They're there to do meet and greets. These. For sure, these and that's definitely. That's these other five players the next night these other five players the next night um that kind of thing plus music a great i idea. think that those combinations you know you gotta have something for everyone not everyone wants to go dance their ass off other people just want to have a chance to meet kona panis you know yeah and that and that's definitely a part of the plan too i think we'll have different people every day obviously and that way nobody gets too beat up by the whole process either but but you know and like uh, hopefully you know, hopefully the, the people that come the first night will have enough fun that they'll come the second night just to hang out. Yeah, and maybe and it could build to be something huge by the final day. That's but either way, I think I handling it independently, you know, each, you know, each, each night you got something, you know, something, something different. Yeah. Did yeah. You and, nice? and I think the keys, I think the key is going to be to start immediately and then me, you know, it it may already be going on before that last putt drops, you know, it just depends. I mean, that at some point there's going to be just as many people that would just as soon sit there and watch, watch a broadcast as walk the whole course too. So having, um, having the pro tour live feed on big televisions oh, and lounge chairs and or couches or some seating area um, offered in that area could catch people from going to 17 and 18 you catch them on 16 and they don't you know they don't go to 17 18 they just go to the, the vendor area they get some food they sit on the bleachers they watch the final two things go down they listen to the music they enjoy the atmosphere you know you can grab them on it's 16. definitely part of the plan without a doubt you know the the there's already at least a 20 by 20 that's going to go between our vending our vending tent and the throw pink tent and it's that whole this whole thing's evolving it's definitely yeah. evolving but it's going to be um it's going to be on point for sure i'm excited um the last the only critique i have from last year on the vendor village for me personally was that um the line was so long sometimes for the food that it was just like oh there's no way I'm that's being alleviated that. that's definitely yeah, i'm alleviated. sure you guys have you know having like extra people at peak hours or something that was one of the first things Jonathan and I talked about after it was over last year too, was just going, yeah, we got to up this, this has got to, yeah. we got to work that out. And, and, and yeah. that's, that and was I the only it, thing that I felt like was like, Oh, this isn't great, but I'll, I'll wait in line, you know? Well, so, you know, that it's the whole, like, he's pretty much got all the parking lots. Like y'all are going to come in is well, I mean, this is still not a hundred percent set in stone. But the way he wants it to happen is, is the players are going to come in from the back way, from from the other end of the property. You're not, there's oh. not going to be there's not going to be any driving down the road between oh. five and seven and sixteen, like that. That I mean, there may not even be golf carts on that road. There will probably be very very few golf carts on that road. But sure. it's basically like 
Um, all the parking, none of the parking will be on the course again. It'll all the paved parking lots will be VIP parking. And there's the uh, the other parking hasn't been worked out completely yet. Like Cherry Road has 600 parking spaces in it, and it's obviously a couple of blocks. It's about a block and a half walk to 13th T pad. And so, but it's, we'll see how that all plays out. Uh, that's, yeah, I, you have to provide shuttles, I think. Yeah, it's just, um, that's a, that's a big insurance undertaking right there, too. So, I mean, I'm not sure how that's all going to get worked out, but I'm sure that it's going to be necessary. Yeah, I know that, um, there's been a lot of player, a lot of player shuttling, um, this year on the Pro Tour. Um, we had to do it at Masters Cup, we had to do it at Jonesboro. Um, we had they did it at they did it at a couple other events mm -hmm. so i there's a resource there for you guys you know um that has dealt with this guys. you know this is the shuttling issue prior you know i don't know if it's jeff spring is the right person to talk to or phil delone or we even talk to the, even oh, the hey, i guarantee you jonathan's got that covered in some form or fashion yeah i'm just saying there's people that have been dealing with that this year because we've had a lot oh, I got of you. i got you of We've had to park off site and shuttle to the course. It's it's been you know half That's regular. That's tough, isn't it? That's kind of it a pain is, it's not pain ideal. It is a pain in the ass, but it is also, you know, what do you do when you have this great property of this great course and there's no parking anywhere on it? Yeah. The vans you know? aren't equipped to do deal with carts and stuff. It's, it's a pain. Yeah. So there's there's issues with the shuttling, but we are dealing with the shuttling and it's not something that we're completely um uh foreign to. But yeah, I think that's a good place. I mean, if you cannot, if the players don't have to shuttle, that's ideal. Um, but shuttling the um, spectators. No, I don't think that's part. Of, that's not part of the plan. Yeah, players, but, but shuttling, players shuttling, players shuttling the player, the player hospitality area is, as far as I understand it right now, is still going to be in the same spot. Which was and great. The, it was a great. The road, the road that you'll come in on comes goes along like i don't know if you're how familiar you are but like if you go towards the track and then hang a right before you get in the parking lot of the track there's a dirt road that goes past the greenhouse and the landfill and there's a back gate over there i've never gone all the way to the back gate but i've gone all the way to the landfill which is like the last thing and yeah. um apparently there's um a way that can be you know obviously we'll be in control of it you know the staff or or a rhino or both yeah, my one like tiny suggestion, I'm not sure if this is feasible, but is um, to offer that same entry for players during practice days. Because if they come to the course and they don't read the emails and they don't know, they're going to come to the front and they ain't going to know. But if you offer that entrance during practice rounds and parking during practice rounds, I'll make that suggestion then they might, they'll be more accustomed to it and it will mitigate problems. with. Yeah, players. it's definitely a good idea for them to get used to it before the day. At least maybe two days prior, you know, just be like, hey, you should come in the back gate. It takes you directly to the player parking. This is what you'll use for the tournament. We recommend you try, you know, you use it for practice rounds as well. I would assume so, that that's probably, that they're probably already leaning in that direction just because they want to yeah. keep, the, keep the traffic off the course. But, yeah. you know, things change overnight there on that situation too, so. I'm sure. I mean, like from Wednesday to Thursday this year, or Tuesday to Wednesday. It's not the last oh, minute yet. You got oh, it. Yeah, We're, yeah. I have full confidence. Yep. You guys oh, always yeah, yeah. They got it covered. And, you know, I'm just one piece of that puzzle. An important cog in the wheel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and I'm not trying to diminish that. I mean, I'm, it's, I've worn more hats out there than almost everybody. Oh, go do this. Okay, here you go, Brian. Hey, wait, now here's what I got for you today. Come with me. Well, we look forward to seeing you out there again. And yep. then Saturday night, um, I'm sorry, we're not going to stay for whatever show you have planned, but we're headed to Burt. In South, we have a two-hour drive south to Florence, and, um, South Carolina. Burt Kreischer. Burt Kreischer is two hours, huh? It's two, hour, it's, it's two hours away from Savannah's on Sunday there, isn't it? Um, I don't think it's They're Savannah. Playing. It's um, South Charleston on Sunday. Yeah. It's Florence on Saturday, South Charleston on Sunday. Yep. Which is he's, further away. He's playing here right before that. I think he starts that tour here. Mm -hmm. Possibly, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm yeah. pretty sure that he's starting that leg of the tour in Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. uh, nice. Yeah, that seems right. Sounds right. That sounds right. So um 
if that's if that's true um yeah i'll be I'm, I'll, I'll be working on that and cool. they, didn't you say something about bird being at the players village during the championship yeah but i don't think that's true i don't think that's going to actually happen because if you look at the tour dates there he's he's got dates all four of those days and oh. they're close by and it's and it's actually a strong possibility that he will show up over there but it won't be for very long like he might show up in the morning and then like if she's if like that saturday show for that's two hours away he might show yeah. up at his bus on that morning on the way from somewhere else and i think he's coming from north to south there or whatever yeah yeah it but might be he won't, he won't be there for long you yeah. know most time he's gonna have to tear out because it just depends we'll see how much of a fan he is yeah i guess because <laughs> i mean and ultimately he's in charge like the tour manager oh, can say whatever sure. he wants but oh, he's, yeah. he's paying the tour manager too absolutely that's what so i'm saying we'll he doesn't have total freedom wouldn't it be yeah. great to, wouldn't it be great to play around with him though that's what I want. I want to go play nine blow up. holes with him yeah. after his set. Like, imagine. Just right, he like, usually goes and parties. Like, this is, let's party at the course tonight. Yeah, get some Frisbees in his hands when he parties. Come on, yeah. let's go. He plays. Oh, he plays. I mean, it's not oh, like. We, we know he plays. But, but has he played blow? He needs to learn how to drink and play at the same time. I know he knows how well, to play. Yeah. I know he knows how to drink. Just bring the two together. Well, and then glow, right? Has he ever played a glow oh. round? That's some of the funnest golf ever. Yeah, yeah. I think that I think I've yeah. I've never laughed more than playing glow. Yeah, which is it's the best. You the same course you've seen a hundred times. You put lights on the disc. You put lights on the basket. All of a sudden, it's you know you've yeah. entered into the, the the fairy world over there. It's amazing. It's different. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so that's the goal. That's the goal. If you talk to him before I talk to him, let him know. I want to play some glow. I'll, nice. I'll I'll bring all the stuff. Put that on your notebook there, Mace. Come on, let's go. <laughs> anyway. Hey, it's been awesome. Thank you guys for awesome. having us. Listen, before we go, one last thing. Mm. Uh, one of the comments that really, that I saw that really uh, was really cool. And I thought I agree with you, with them. Uh, here's a direct quote. She seems like a cool chick to have a beer with. So <laughs> I'm glad we're able to do it virtually. But you yeah. are a cool chick to have a beer with. It's been <laughs> awesome to celebrate. Bahaim, Mazel Tov. Enjoy Absolutely, it. yeah. You guys um, are, yeah. are really great. We really appreciate yeah. you guys uh, doing you guys. this today and doing it every week so far. You guys have really brought a lot of extra smiles and, and sunshine to, to the show. And uh, we look forward to hearing you guys every, every time we clock in. We want to hear more from you guys down the road. Safe travels. Enjoy your communing with nature. Serenity now. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. I'll right, be careful and uh, we'll see you real soon. Yes. Yeah, All right. All right, guys.